What I have here are dried peppers. These have been drying for a while. They're ready to go into a jar. And I like to store my peppers this way and preserve my peppers this way. It just makes them easier to toss in soups, recipes. And this basket is some things I need to eat like eggplant and peppers, but it's also a good drying basket because it's got airflow. So I'm gonna hang this one up. We've got to clear off the fireplace so we can start a fire because it's getting chilly tonight. And here is my Dottle Pepper Jam. It's, it's all right. It's not my favorite. I'm really terrible at canning. I don't actually like preserving food this way. I like to dehydrate food um, and I like to ferment food. But we have Dottle Pepper Jam. It does taste good and it'll be a fun holiday gift to give some friends. So I'm gonna go take these down to the basement. This guy also got a little cooked. We toss this over. So we're gonna feed that to the deers. We toss it outside the back over the mountain. What happened to it? It got, it got hot from the fireplace. Oh dang. Yeah.
All right, guys, so I have some food to prep. We have gorgeous leeks. Um, I harvested these yesterday, and I'm going to be making a wild rice and celery recipe. I took out my celery. It was all, I've been harvesting off of this for months, and it was time to go. There's not much left, but I'm going to use what we have. And then I have some greens that I'm going to do something with. I'm not sure yet. I also need to put our peppers away. So these are all dried. As they're dried, I just make containers with them. Uh, these are fermented radish. I'm going to add some turnips to my ferment. We're going to ferment some habanero peppers. Ah, hot habanero peppers. And I need to ferment some banana peppers. So first things first, let me put these in a container. Now you want to make sure these are completely dry. This one's a little damp. If they're not, it can spoil inside the jar and wreck the whole batch. So these are all nice and dry. And I like to do them in clear jars, otherwise I'll forget what's in them. Ah, perfect. I'm running out of room. This could probably use the tidying, but there's no time for that today. So let's see what we can do. Some of them I'm going to eat raw. This is my chicken scrap bowl. These are so, f and these are so funny. They started regrowing where I cut it off. You really want to use these the day you cut them or they can start to brown like mine are. They're still totally fine, but the fresher, the better. With all the food on the tower, I like to harvest it the day I'm going to use it if possible, but life, you know. That is regrowth without any roots. So it's actually regrowing from where I cut it. These are incredible. If you wanna watch my video on how to grow leeks year round, I have that. I will link that in the description below. Where did my eyes? 
right, I'm gonna put some of these aside for salad tonight. And if you're not familiar with what these are, these are a beeswax wrap. Instead of having to use saran wrap, I have like tin foil and saran wrap and actually paper towels creep me out. So it's a useful way to cover food. It's kind of sticky. It's got beeswax on it. I'll put a link to these below. They're awesome. The only thing with this one is it's yellow. And every time I see this one, I have this like creepy McDonald's kids meal flashback. Cause weren't the wrappers in my, when I was a kid, like the wrappers were yellow with a little red. These have faded. So when I first got them, every time I saw them on the table, it just like totally creeped me out with this McDonald's nightmare flashback. All right, so we're gonna wrap these up. You can see they stick really great and you just wash them off. I just use a little soap and water to clean them. Absolutely amazing way, reduces plastic saves money and plastic wrap and tinfoil will creep me out. All right, I'm gonna put these in the fridge and we're gonna cut up our celery. There isn't much to these celeries. I actually made untuna salad with them the other day, but we are gonna use everything we can These are just the last little bits of some celery plants that I have harvested off of for months. All right, guys, I'm sorry it's dark. It's just the nature. Our cabin's dark. Outside it's dark. I am going to use Miyoko's vegan butter because I want to be able to eat this rice and I despise the taste of real butter. Very rarely do I like real butter. Um, Olive oil or avocado oil would probably be healthier, but I really love the flavor this gives them. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the Miyoko's. And I'm using a three quart, I think this is a three quart. This is the super tiny Instapot and I absolutely love it. I had the big one and because we're actually about to remodel the other side of the kitchen because we need a new stove. Our stove doesn't work. These I had found, these were in our basement and I had a friend hang them and build the shelf around them. And I found this piece off of Facebook and added the butcher block. And we're just trying to change. I don't like kitchen cabinets. I think they're very um, wasteful with space. They don't really function really well with like this. Functions amazing. I've got my specific things in this drawer, just way more functional than the cabinets that were here. But for our smaller cabin and because I'm removing, this will be the only upper cabinet in the whole kitchen. I really need to do space saving things like these small three quarts. And because I don't cook any meat or anything, these work totally fine. And having two of them is really nice because you can do rice in one and beans in one and you don't actually even have to use your stove top and they store up pretty easily. I can just stick them right in this cabinet when I'm done. So I'm gonna get these started in the Instapot. A few things I do leave on the counter full time. Um, right now we have our Ninja because we don't have an oven and we leave the Vitamix out because we have kids that eat smoothies every day. I leave my juicer out because I use it almost daily. The Instapot I do like to put away when we're done if we're not using it. And being able to do that means I have to keep things up here pretty minimal. So I have a food processor. It's, a it's on saute. It's a terrible food processor. So I'm looking at doing the one that attaches to the mixer, the KitchenAid mixer, because that would save space. And I have got my bread mill up on this side and then cups, we keep cups up here. So I'm making a pretty big batch of wild rice and this is brown rice and wild rice. So I'm gonna do about two tablespoons of this Miyoko's because the majority the only flavor, actually not the majority, for this rice is coming from the leeks, the bits of celery and the celery greens and salt and that'll be it. If you haven't tried Miyoko's, her stuff is amazing. 
but again it's expensive I, I think of it more as like a treat to add I don't need it I've got olive oil but I just happen to have some of these in the freezer because they were on sale and stocked up on them but really I like to keep our ingredients simple and as pure as possible and this had lots of ingredients in it not bad stuff coconut oil cultured cashew milk cashew cultured water sunflower oil organic sunflower lecithin and sea salt so it's good ingredients it's just expensive and more complex than using olive oil so you can just use olive oil if you want to keep your i like to keep our meals and the things we eat pretty simple what i'm also going to serve with this on the side is lima beans so i'm going to get those soaking once i get the fire going because they're warm on top of the wood burning stove and then i'm going to make a salad and that is a complete meal so let's saute these mm, they smell so good If I had any better celery, I would do a lot more celery. I've actually made this recipe with two full stalks of two full plants of celery, um, but I don't have any that's ready to go right now. So I'm doing the leeks instead. The leeks sort of take the place of the celery. So if you want to try this, either one works. Celery is probably a little easier to get your hands on if you're not growing on a tower. Um, but leeks are a major superfood and they're so delicious. So I'm gonna just let this saute down a little bit. All right, when that's cooking down, I'm gonna prep these habanero peppers and I'm gonna thaw. These are some wild wine berries and wild raspberries from the property. I'm gonna thaw these and we're gonna make a fermented habanero pepper hot sauce with berries. So it's gonna take about seven to 10 days to ferment. And then to finish it off, I'm gonna add just a tiny bit of vinegar and sugar, so delicious. And these habaneros, they have like a little pineapple mango aftertaste, but they are super hot. So this will help take the heat down a little bit and just give them some extra depth but I need these to thaw, so I'm gonna put these in some hot water. And I'm also gonna ferment my banana peppers and we can do those while the others thaw. And I think this jar will work. I like the stems, but some of these are brown. Too many brown tips I'm gonna take off. That's pretty good. Fermenting's really intimidating if you're not familiar with it, but once you get used to it, it's super easy. Now, sometimes it fails. This is my radish ferment, and I like to just keep topping it off and adding radishes because I don't have room in our fridge. These are foods that need to be able to stay outside or stay on the counter for a while. Um, it helps when the weather's cooler because it's cooler in here and I can put them on the porch. These smell so good. And I like to just keep adding to them. But I have had them go bad too. And so if they go bad, you just do it all over again. The key to keeping them from going bad, I have found, is a couple of things. I They, they say to do, it's recommended one to three tablespoons of salt 
per, what is this, 16 ounces, right? Is this a quart? Per jar. Was this 24 ounces? I don't know. And I do the three, so I keep it high because I'm keeping these out for a long period of time. And then anytime I open the jar, I actually t put a little bit of salt on the top. And our mixture is smoking back there, so let's go check on that. Look at these little tiny ones. Ooh. They're getting soft, a little browning. They smell amazing. I'm gonna add a little salt to get them to release any little bits of water that are left. And I use Redmond's Real Salt, my absolute favorite. I use that for my ferments as well. These look perfect. All right, so now I'm just gonna add my rice. I usually don't buy them in these small packages. I buy them by the 25 pound bag, but these were on clearance and I had gotten them from um, Misfits when I was ordering from them. Okay, so it's one and a half cups to two quarts. How much is a quart? Madeline! How much is a quart? How much is a quart? Combine one and a half cups water. Will you Google how many? How many quarts are in a? How many cups are in a quart? How many cups are? In a quart? Four cups. Four cups. Okay. So if you do this and you buy in bulk, I write it on the buckets, the instructions, because I will never remember. So it's saying four cups is a quart. So I need eight cups of water. So we're going to half that because we don't want that much. I want four cups of water. So I need one and a half. I need three fourths cup of this rice. These are equal to equal, so I'm going to add, let me add this water first, so I don't forget my math. Now this is brown rice, and I don't need this because this is a mixture. A lot of times my wild rice is just black. It doesn't have this extra stuff in it. This is a gourmet rice blend, but I do want to use it up because I've had it for quite some time. And I want to add some brown rice, so I'm just going to do equal parts of this brown rice. So let's do like that much and I will add that much more water okay so we're good there and actually I was wrong the more I thought about this I always add a bouillon when I'm making brown rice and wild rice because it is nuttier and a little crunchier and not as rich in flavor um, it's rich in flavor. I shouldn't say that. We want this to be very savory, like a meal. So when you put the beans on top of it, you have a complete meal. So I'm going to add a vegetable bouillon. I get these at Azure, so I know they're clean. And this will just up level the flavor. You don't have to do this, but it takes it to the next level so that it feels like a meal, more like a casserole, but without the, all the bad things that casseroles have in them. All right, I'm going to cook this. <sighs> Pressure cook high for 17 minutes. And we're good, let's get started on our ferments. And then I'll clean them after. We're gonna do our ferment in the Vitamix. All right, I decided if I'm gonna ferment, I wanna go ahead and harvest anything off the tower that I can ferment because these need to be harvested and turned over for the winter. Um, and I know I have one turnip. It's a decent size, but it's started to split. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this one going. I think this is the only one. I wanna make sriracha, but I don't have enough red jalapenos yet. All right, we got our turnip. So. 
formal instruction is three tablespoons per one quart. And we just learned a quart is four cups. There's a little rice in that one. All right, so half a quart. I should know the size of these jars, but I don't. All right, so we got a half a quart here, about. And I'm still gonna do three tablespoons, because like I mentioned, I like to go a little heavy on the salt. Um, for one, peppers are pretty potent. So when the saltier you make them, and the longer you ferment them, the better they taste. And just to be careful, because I'm not gonna be putting these in the fridge, these are gonna be a long ferment. I definitely want them to be um, well salted. So let's add three tablespoons. All right, and you can add any seasoning to these. I'm actually going to add one special ingredient, and I'm gonna to have to dump some of this water out, adding the salt. I am going to add fermented garlic. This is fermented and honey to this recipe. So it's gonna give it a little sweetness, and then we'll have the amazing fermented honey. Kind of pushing on things a little you can see the air bubbles coming up there's a stem and then sprinkle salt right on the top i feel like that protects the most uh, compromised area which is where there could be bacteria and air come together and we're gonna seal this up so i will open this every day and let it bubble out until i feel like it's really um firm until it's fermented essentially and then we can start eating them so it looks gorgeous and this will just go on our shelf let's get this one prepped actually let's do the turnip and then we'll get the other one prepped these greens I'm going to add to our dinner. I'll put them in the rice at the very end. Those are delicious. I'm going to cut off a couple of these bad spots here. They're not bad. They're just hardened from the sun. So I can give it a little um, woodier texture. So for the sake of keeping it nice and tender, and then these are getting sliced super thin. I'm just making sure they're under this water here. And we're gonna add more salt. And have one more tablespoon. Sprinkle on the top. Sometimes I like to do this as well. Sprinkle it on the top of the lid so that if there's anything on a lid like this, it's not gonna grow. Okay, 
All right, I think those are thawed enough. These smell so good. These are some strawberries too from my garden. Now for the hot part. I tasted one of these earlier because I was wondering if it was a sweet habanada. It was not, it's super spicy. So this is going to make a really kicking hot sauce with layered depths of flavor. My plunger is lost, so we're just going to shake it. All right, some of those strawberries are frozen, so I'm going to give those a second, and I'm going to add honey garlic to this one as well. Yum. That is so incredible. We're gonna have to cut that. The fermenting will mild it. And then this will definitely have to be cut with some vinegar and sugar because yowzers. Whew. Okay. Don't accidentally drink that. That is hot. It's good though, it's got good flavor. Very, um, I don't know, we'll wait till it's done fermenting and then I'll tell you what it tastes like because we're not gonna be able to gauge it right now with cold berries and... All right, let's see. I'm going to go with four tablespoons. Stir this in. It's nice and thick. And it's good it's thick because that gives us room to cut this with some vinegar and if we need to sugar or honey, I'll do honey. Ooh, that's already so much better with the salt. It's hot, but it's so flavorful. It's like that kind of hot that tastes so good that you want to eat the whole thing, but it's so hot you would just light yourself on fire. Been there, done that multiple times. Okay, we're good. I'm going to sprinkle the top with salt. I'm gonna turn this camera around on you. My daughter's dancing behind the screen. Girl? Girl? Alright. You think you can flip that as soon as I stop? There we go. Madeline, don't drink this. It's not a smoothie. Oh. It looks like a smoothie. It does. It is supremely hot. I wanna try it. Ooh, you wanna try it? What? Yeah, come here. You gotta do it on camera though. <laughs> Come over here. Do I want to? You do, just just a little dab. Okay, ready? You gotta be coming <laughs> here. Finger put your finger in there. Don't lick it because it's super strong. Yeah. Should I? Yeah. Yeah. 
is scared. You're saying it's so hot and you have like a hot tolerance. It's not that bad. And you have a hot tolerance. Come on, come on. You can do it. Can I? Yeah. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Scared. I feel like it's some sort of medicine. No. Ooh. Isn't that good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hot. It's good and it's bad at the same it's time. It's hot. So the chase is good and then it like takes you right in the face. Alright, we have four minutes on that. Want some? All right, guys, so little tip if you live in a small house, get chairs on wheels that you can flip around so I can sit by the fire because it's getting a little chilly. And I wanted to finish this video by sharing some books with you guys. Um, Roots and Refuge, a couple of weeks ago, was talking about what's going on with AI and all the books that are coming on the market that are being written by AI and just some of the dangers of that, for one. Um, we use AI as part of business in this house, so, you know, it is a thing that is happening and it's out there, but people are just clicking in, like, someone could say, write a book on growing on an aeroponic tower garden, and AI can only pick information from the web. So it's limited, and I think so many years back, too. I don't know all the details, I'm not an expert. But it's just pulling information, so it's pulling in bad information. So my an example of that is a friend has a sticker business and is doing a certain fish on his sticker, and AI actually doesn't know the correct anatomy of that fish yet. And that's a real eye-opener and something to be mindful of. Um, blog posts are being written, being written by AI. Uh, YouTube videos like I only watch people that I know are actual people because of that so she was just saying you know we should all get out there and share book resources of good books to help us all build a great library of real books so we have real information so if we go onto the web and we look at something we can verify that or we can just use our books which is probably a better idea so i'm going to go through a couple of books this is obviously not an exhaustive list i will say i get the majority of my books on medicinal wellness from azure standard they do a good job vetting their books for um topics that i don't like in my books when it gets into some of the spirituality of using essential oils and herbs i'm not into that that's i'm interested in the medicinal properties and the science behind the plants and why they work for certain things so azure does a great job of kind of vetting their books so when i buy a book from azure i know it's focused on the topic and doesn't have a lot of that added fluff in it so i'm going to pull some of my favorite ones and yeah, let's just dive right in. Now, you saw me today. I don't even know what a quart is, how many cups are in a quart. And that's because I've been doing the from scratch thing for many years. So I don't really follow recipes most of the time. I use them as guides, but I don't have to follow recipes a lot of times. And then especially with medicinal things too, I'm kind of past that, but I do use these to reference. So not all of them are ones I grab daily, but I like to have them for when I have a question, I know where to go and I can pull these off my shelf to get the answer. All right, and actually I went and grabbed a couple more that I think are really important. So for making, let me see if I can categorize these a little bit. If you, so let's start with herbs and making your own medicinals. So you need a good field guide to know what plants are in your area, what's safe to eat, and how to identify them. So I have one for my area, medicinal plants of the Southern Appalachians. That's 
direct that's the region we live in so i can reference this when i'm confused about something and i can go out on hunts like goldenrod's very common here so i can read up on goldenrod and some of these when they're not familiar ginseng is really common here it's actually poached quite a bit i can go like gentian i don't actually know what that is off the top of my head so sometimes i'll just browse through this and then go on a hunt and i have an app on my phone called picture this and i can verify and then i also verify on the internet and then in picture books this book does not have pictures in it which is one of the downsides. I think guides with pictures are more beneficial, but definitely getting a field guide to the medicinals in your region is a great idea. This one, you have probably seen this on the internet, on the social media. They advertise very heavily this book, and there's a couple of other ones in this series, but it's really good. It's by Nicole Apelian and Claude Davis and it's an expensive book for what you get it's pretty basic but I also think that's a really good thing especially for people who are new to using wild herbs and medicinals and they did a great job with the photos and that's why I purchased this one so I like to just read this one from time to time and I really appreciate the quality photos in here because you know when you find it outside you can verify it against this and get it right so excellent book and that is the lost book of herbal remedies i will link as many of these as i can in the description below some of these um i'll just try and find them this one's like pretty hand this is like a self-published book still great excellent overpriced but excellent medicinal wild plants um, this is a field guide to medicinal wild plants I've bought this one. I haven't used this one yet, but I do like that this one has pictures in it. Now these are drawn pictures where the last book is photos, but I picked this one up at Azure mainly to have a reference book that's medicinals with photos in it. And it's got great content. It goes through the family, the common names, the characteristics, the areas you're going to find it, and then the uses for these plants. So beautiful. Got this one at Azure standard. Highly recommend this book just sitting in you know, just having this as a field guide. The other cool thing is there's a list on the back of what's in here. So the revised edition of a classic field guide includes characteristics, distribution, and medicinal uses of over 120 wild plants. And those are listed on the back so you know what is in here. How to make medicine out of your books. I love the modern herbal dispensary. I've taken a lot of his classes. This is from the, uh, what is his name? Oh, Thomas Easley. I couldn't remember his name. I've taken a lot of his online classes. They're excellent. And this is a great book. This is going to tell you how to formulate. So once you know what you have, then what do you do with it? This is your guide on what to do with it. Excellent book. Not super simple recipes. You know, you're getting pretty, um, I would say, intermediate to advanced in these. This isn't just adding some herbs to some vodka to make a tincture. This is going a little bit deeper into how do you use it, how to add other things to them and just get taking it to the next level. Excellent book. And then this one I got at Azure and this one's the beginner's phase before that next book. So if you wanted to start somewhere, start with this one over the modern dispensary. This is definitely, like you can tell this one's used because I need to reference how to do some of these things when I'm getting into more advanced uses where this one's not, this is pretty straightforward. Herbal recipes for healing the whole family and a tincture for a loose tooth. We've got goldenrod leaf, white oak bark, turmeric root, birch bark, and some vodka and apple cider vinegar. You know, pretty short, non-complex recipes in here. I got this one at Azure Standard, so I'll link that below. Really, really love having this on hand. These are books that I hope my children will take and keep and will have, like these are pass me down books that just have valuable information to help with natural living and healing and simple living and all the amazing things. So that's it for the herb books. Um, I also recommend this one. I am an aromatherapist. I specialized in aromatic medicine, and I really like this book because it's not, some of the books out on the market, 
Okay, my, my camera died. Yeah, so a lot of the aromatherapy books on the market are written by essential oil companies and not a problem. I just find this one to be a better source. This is written by experts, aromatherapists who've been using essential oils and have collected data for years and years and years and years. And so this is a much more, I don't want to say more complicated because it's not. Um, I just think it's a better resource than some of the more modern ones that are coming out of the essential oil industry. So tummy trouble kind of explains, then tells you what to do. Gives you a few options. Food poisoning, what do you do? How do you use it? How exactly to take it? So very, very helpful. This is an excellent resource. There's so many books on essential oils out in the market and I feel like this is really the only one you need as a guide. It's the only one I need as a guide. It's got health and healing, beauty, and a toxic free environmental uses for your house, like kitchen supplies and stuff too. So it's more than just medicinals. All right, topics on food. How Not to Die. And he wrote a new book, and I'm actually buying it for myself over the Thanksgiving holiday to read it. I'm super excited. Love this book. I reference this book all the time. I read it in the bath. Books like this inspire me to eat healthier and make better choices. So I like to reference these books often. Just I'll just sit around and read it in the bathtub. It's like how not to die from this disease, how not to die from that disease, but really great things. Just really great information about plants and why some of them are super healing to our bodies. I really enjoy this. And look at that. I enjoy books that are thick. That's a thick book. Um, with foods, fermented vegetables. This one came from Azure and that's what you guys saw me do today. And it's just a guide for fermenting foods. I think fermenting is super beneficial for gut health and it's a great way to use up vegetables when you have excess and it's simple and you can preserve food without having to can. I'm a terrible canner, I've decided. And I really like this one. I haven't spent a lot of time in this particular one. I got it more just to have as a reference just because a lot of foods, I just know how to ferment them right now, but definitely a great source and I've skimmed it when I get bored. You can make pepper paste. Ooh, you can make black bean paste that's fermented so good. So that's a great resource from Azure. I'll link that below. The other one, and I do use this one, Cultured Food for Health. I believe I got this one at Azure as well. And it's the same thing. So flu prevention, cultured vegetables, thank you kraut, roasted carrot kefir salad, cashew kefir Italian cheesecake, just tons and tons of recipes in here. Fermented hummus, that's like the black beans I was talking about. Um, just lots of really fun fermented food recipes, which are all about health. All right, sticking with the food themes, I really love this Ancient Grains book. If you get into buying ingredients and making things from scratch and stocking up food, you've heard me mention, maybe not on YouTube, on my social media, on my stories, I share a lot our pantry and how I keep a year's worth of supply of everything plus a couple of years of other things. This tells you how to use all that stuff because if you've got grains, what do you do with them? So this is recipes like fermented bread dough, millet tortillas, chutney. Um, you can make cookies. She also gets into things like toxic metal and health issues and why you should have this kind of food on hand for emergencies and things like that. So there's more to it. There's gamma acid, canola oil, why you should avoid those. So there's information on health. There's information on preparedness in here. And then most importantly, it tells you like how in the heck do you use sucanat and recipes to use sucanat. So you can make food from scratch with the purest ingredients. This one is at Azure and then everything you would use in this book, you can find at Azure. Um, I have not read this one. This is preserving food without freezing or canning traditional techniques using salt, oil, sugar, alcohol, vinegar, drying, cold storage, and lactic fermentation. This one came from Azure. I have not even opened it yet, but another great idea if you don't like freezing or canning, which I'm just not good at it. Like how do you make tomato sauce and preserve it? There's ways to do that in here. So I thought that was a great one to have on hand 
and I'll read it. I can't really speak of it much, but um, it seemed like a good resource. Icorn, I have a lot of icorn wheat berries, so I have a book on using icorn. If you buy already ground icorn flour and pastas, they're very expensive, but if you buy the berries and grind them yourself, they're actually quite affordable. So if you have icorn or you want to get better at icorn, icorn is an ancient grain. It's a little bit less uh, gluten in it. It hasn't been tampered with, more of an heirloom. So people who have gluten issues, some can tolerate icorn flour just fine because it's more of an ancient grain that hasn't been messed with. The Baker Creek Vegan Cookbook. I reference this one for fun. Sometimes I grow a lot of their seeds. This is, you'll see me when I talk about a lot of seed varieties, you'll see me talk about rareseeds.com. This is their cookbook. So I like it because sometimes when I'm like, what do I do with this pepper? They've come up with a recipe. So rainbow chard, grape and delicata squash salad, really unique things, amaranth breakfast pudding, garlic non bread, caramelized figs with maple cream and crystallized ginger, really fun stuff. Um, a good reference book. This one goes into the medicinals. This is a fire cider book. So this is specifically making fire cider, but there's a lot of different ones in here. So we've got apple cider tonic, hot vinegars, four thieves vinegars, fruit scrap vinegar, apple cider vinegar um, that's the chapter on that fire d cider uh grand grindles goodness fire cider 40 thieves so the possibilities thai red curry fire cider so these are just fire cider if you're not familiar it's just really nutrient dense medicinal foods and you put them together and you make medicines and Fire cider has saved me on many, many, many occasions. Love it, it tastes so good too. So great book, got that one at Azure. All right, the last two books. This one I just pulled out. I really like, there's a couple in this series. I have two of them. I don't know if there's more than that. And this is plenty. And sometimes something like the Baker Creek cookbook can be pretty bland food. And I don't say that as an insult. It's just simple foods. Like we've got flour, hot water, salt, vegetable oil, diced onion, ginger, um, broccoli, soy sauce, sesame seed, and garlic chili. That's pretty basic ingredients. This is not. This is a fancy restaurant. I think it's from a restaurant somewhere. I don't really know. And these are really deep, rich recipes and I find inspiration. Sometimes you just gotta step it up a level. So broccoli and gorgonzola pie. They, now I will say these do have a lot of cheese in them so sometimes I have to modify those. But his pictures are gorgeous. And I, I pull this one out. I probably have like 30 cookbooks like this. Just to say having a couple of books that have really great pictures and really rich recipes can help you become a better cook using raw ingredients or things that you've grown. So I really like his books for that reason. I don't always have the things he recommends on hand, but I can kind of tweak them and make my food a little bit richer and a little bit more restaurant-like just by getting inspiration from his recipes or getting them as close to possible as some of the stuff he creates. So these are fun. I've got plenty, and I think the second one's called Plenty More, and that may be the only two in the series. And then the last book, um, I would pull out my gardening books, but I don't use them anymore because I'm not growing in the soil. I'm growing in the towers. And I have a book coming out very, very soon, and it will be linked in the description below as soon as it's available on how to grow in a tower garden, um, how many seeds to start, what you can grow, what not to grow, how to deal with pests. It's very, very in-depth, covering everything that I know to this point, and I will update it as I learn more things. And that'll be available very soon. You can look in the description to see if it's available when you watch this video. So the only book I'm gonna bring to the table for growing your own food is Grow a Little Fruit Tree. So most people don't have space to grow an orchard. We don't have space to grow an orchard. We live in the forest. So the way I grow fruit trees to add to our diet is I landscape in our berries and things like um, blackberries and raspberries are landscaped into the forest line and then blueberries and honeyberries and 
aronia berries and every berry I can think of that will grow here. I just landscape them in around our house instead of bushes. I have blueberry bushes. And then for the trees, I get trees and I grow them as these little tiny trees. And the benefit of this is that anybody can have an orchard because we keep them super small but it also makes them easier to manage. And I grow on the towers because the towers are easy to manage. I don't have to haul compost, all of the difficult things that come with gardening in the soil. And this is the same concept. Instead of dealing with a huge apple tree that you have to prune and clean up and harvest all the apples off the ground to keep bugs away and things from your house, you've got this tiny little tree that it's going to grow the food you need with maybe a little excess and that's it. So I really love this resource. So I hope this gives you some ideas um, on some books to stock up on and some topics to maybe grow and expand your knowledge on. My goal moving forward with this channel and I don't want to make promises, but my goal is on Tuesdays and Thursdays to launch videos specific to tower gardening with information on how to grow specific foods. And then on Sundays share with you guys sort of a day in the life vlog style video where it's simple living, get a lot of people request how to eat the food that we grow. So sharing some of the ways that we eat the food we grow and just giving you a glimpse into our lives here in our cabin in the Appalachian mountains. So I hope you will join me. Thanks for watching this video and all the videos that you do watch and all the amazing comments. I really appreciate it. And I will see you guys on the next video.